Atheist Nomads episode 129, a science comic with Miles Greb. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-haws. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. And joining us today is, after the gold rush, a science comic creator, Miles Greb. Yeah, that's me. Thanks for having me, guys. Welcome to Atheist Nomads. Yeah, glad to be here. Yay. So tell us a bit about this comic. Yeah, sure. Um, After the Gold Rush, it's it's my first comic. Uh, It was independently created, and uh, we ran a successful Kickstarter a while ago. We had a lot of great support. Uh, um, Big help that I I got to be on SGU kind of while the campaign was going on, and that really um, got me a lot of people in the community and the hard science, skeptic, and kind of atheist movements that were really supportive of the book. Uh, What the book's about, however, is um, it's about um, science returning to like a future world where it is traded away. It's not this typical post-apocalyptic story, however, um, because it's a paradigm shift that's happened in the world, but it isn't like some barren landscape. It's actually quite beautiful. It almost looks like 16th century North America. Um, Hmm. But it doesn't have all the technology and all the innovation that, you know, the methodology of science has given us. Um, These people are in a whole new kind of worldview where it's all about narrative based thinking. I I can't say too much about it because I'm not trying to give away too much of the story. I'm kind of protective of it, but that's kind of where we find ourselves. It's this this clash of ideas is kind of the crux of the story. So kind of a combination of postmodernism and this weird, all natural anti-modernism. Yeah, you could you could say that again. I, I can't comment directly because I'm kind of <laughs> our, our main antagonist Gutenberg. Um, I, ha- I haven't totally introduced him yet. People have seen his concept art, but he's not in the first issue. So mm. his mm. take on everything will be really important. But you know, you have to stay tuned to find out what his deal is. Okay. But um, our, our first issue it it follows Scout, who um, was the first born of uh, of Titan, which is one of the satellites of Saturn. Um, she was born on the Beagle 2 mission, you know, named after Darwin's famous uh, mission where he, as a, um, he wasn't an evolutionary biologist at the time, he, they called him, you know, natural scientists. But, you know, that's his voyage when he went mm-hmm. on and eventually uh, generated his hypothesis for um, natural selection. Um, but, yeah, that's what we named the ship. And um, so that. That ship's the first ship on Titan. It's an expedition. Um, but something went wrong. And some time has passed. And so the ship is returning its, its lone survivor to Earth. And um, that's our main hero, Scout. She returns. And she doesn't find it like this Star trek style, you know, kind of high-tech, advanced society that it once was. And instead, she, you know, finds it grassland and empty. So that's kind of where our story starts. Mm. That's awesome. Nice. <laughs> okay. So, uh would you say that they shun technology, though? Yeah, that's. I mean, it's it's gone. I mean, the the technology is is pretty basic that they have. I mean, technically, you know, putting food on a stump is technology, I guess. Wow. So, I mean, they have they have some technology, but most of what we have, metal and you know, wire working, electricity, all that's gone. Okay. Nice. Well, you described it as being roughly 16th century, so yeah, that's kind of the setting. Of- yeah, back a. A few steps. pre-industrial revolution. So I, yeah. I was kind of thinking like a, a Star Trek with the the holodeck, you know, where you know you can have like the wide open natural spaces, but just behind the walls, behind the panels, you'll have like a wiring or stuff hidden, but just <laughs> none of that. Okay. No, no, none of it. Oh. Although there but, is a Star Trek episode, uh, it was Deep Space Nine, where they end up uh, coming onto this planet that it has shunned uh, all technology and modernism. Yeah, I'm Man. trying to figure, isn't there a reason why, weren't they like, I forget, I think it was more complicated than that in that particular episode, I think they, they went through a cycle where people died, and so they did it for a reason. It was a colony that was moving back to, or wanting to go back to uh, agriculture. Uh, a bunch of naturalistic fallacy people. Naturalist, <laughs> naturalistic people, and then they crashed on the wrong planet, and the 
person who ended up taking control. Um, oh yeah, and that girl was like, it was a, it was a girl who was in charge, and she was like yep. super big zealot about it. I remember that. Yeah, and she <laughs> suppressed everything that wasn't her vision of, of things. Off. I remember that episode. Yeah, I'm not a huge DS9 guy. I've seen every episode, but <laughs> I, I'm I'm a TOS TNG guy, so. I just think DS9 is a little pessimistic, and um, I really like the <laughs> optimistic, you know, we're going to get better kind of future, mm-hmm. which just despite the paradigm shift that happens in my story, it, a major theme of it is is optimistic sci-fi, which is something I grew up with, and I really like to try to bring back because it's kind of the, the, the theme right now to say everything's going to suck. Like, if you go watch a movie and you see a bunch of trailers, everything's about, you know, it's the atom bomb again. It's, oh, look what science did. Science made this virus science made this ai science made this way to bring people's minds back from the dead and it's awful and you know we're living in an era where people live longer than they've ever lived people can communicate further and easier than they ever communicated they can get i mean infinite media for free online i mean things are getting better that doesn't mean there's no problems but i just don't like this negative outlook everybody has on our progression Mm -hmm. oh yeah when right now science is not only has it done so much but the the potential is tremendous for what it can do further and the past is not as good as it's as everybody makes it out to be yeah i mean some things were good you know like um my football team used to be better in the past so there are things in the past that are better mm-hmm. comics were better but, but and that's debatable come on now i uh, have a book from one of my history classes in college called the good old days they were terrible yeah they were <laughs> terrible man i mean like so right people now, died early I don't have to worry about food. I, you know, I work in IT, I do computer stuff, and then I come home and I can get whatever food I want. I don't have to work out in the fields. That'd be terrible. Yeah, you don't have to walk 10 miles for freaking water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, Definitely. people still have to do that in third world countries now. Well, plus, like I said, we have crazy. infinite information online. Like, if I don't know how to do something, you just figure it out for free. Mm-hmm. Like, you have to put the work in, obviously. But, I mean, like, you can take classes... Um, on neuroscience from Harvard for free on their website. Like, oh, damn. technology's pretty good. Yeah. You can learn everything. Just cost you everything for the degree. Yeah, well, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another problem. But that's, you know, that's that's civics. Civics mm-hmm. is a little harder than science <laughs> because you can't get good data. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like, not, not to get political, not the issue, just the <laughs> methodology of it. But when people talk about, like, like gun control, they want to analyze Sweden, Canada, America, but th- there are so many other different civics at play. They're not good controls. So, e- I mean, if you're for or against X amount of gun control, you can't necessarily say, well, look at this model here and look at this model here because they're not like scenarios. So, like, you know, you're arguing all these points, but it's not how we, it's not the kind of threshold of good data that we would use for talking about, you know, biological health. But we use it for talking about civic self, which makes civics, you know, very difficult to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. There are so many different factors at play. Uh, very difficult to control for all the variables. Yeah. And you never know which one just totally ruins it for you. So, yeah. Yeah. With, you know, and, and yeah, running with the, uh, the whole gun control part, just the relationship between, you know, gun control and violent crime. Do places with more gun control have violent crime because there's more gun control or do they have more gun control because they have more violent crime? Yeah. And there's also, you know, the hypothesis that's often stated that it, it's a cultural thing, for example, in America. Um, how do you determine that, though? I mean, it does anecdotally appear to be true. It, it's, you know, a lot of gunfighting and stuff is part of our culture, it appears. But I mean, how do you actually show that that is affecting the attitude and that has is causal? to all these mass shootings we have. It's, it's very difficult. And uh, what really sucks is, you know, no matter what side you're on the argument, it can be difficult because even the kind of the trendsetters for your side of the argument are likely to be using bad data. And then if you try to ask questions about it and be a good skeptic, you can be ostracized. Um, like, for example, I'll be like, okay, I, I think we should probably do more for gun control. I, I am of that opinion. I don't think this, you know, caption you're sending around, I don't think this is a good way to look at the data. You know, do you think there's a better way? And they automatically assume you are of the other party now because they're not really used to that kind of, you know, questioning and trying to use skepticism to talk about stuff. So it it can be quite difficult to talk about issues, which is another point of my book is I'm trying to make more skeptical characters in media so that people get used to 
what it means to be a skeptic, what it means to try to break down information. And they don't see it as nagging or being annoying, but seeing it as a positive character trait. Very nice. And so you've gotten the first uh, issue out? Yeah, the first issue is done. Um, so I had, uh, I haven't sent it to everybody yet on Kickstarter. Some people pay for like extra early editions. So, you know, I'm making sure they get theirs first. And about next week, I'm going to send out the digital copies to everybody. And the paper, the... I got the like preview paper copies, but my big bulk shipment of them won't be in for a couple of weeks and those will be going out, but people can get a digital copy of the book starting next week. Awesome. So you're still selling those uh, digital copies? Though? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm trying to make sure I get everybody who paid on Kickstarter theirs first. So starting next week, I'll be selling digital copies, you know, ever onward. I just want to honor everybody's commitment for supporting me and helping make the book a reality first. So. But uh, I have a website, which is uh, after the gold rush dot space. And you can also see me on Twitter at, uh, at gold rush comic. And, you know, you can get the book pretty soon. But like I said, everybody was really awesome to support me and help me make this book. So I just want to make sure I get them their copies first. How much for the how much? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's three ninety nine right now oh, on sure. the website. Yeah. Well, fuck, I guess I'll have to pick up a copy. Yeah, it's uh, it's 22 pages, um, the main book. And then we have uh, we have web comic, which follows Scout back when she was on Titan. And she's doing like some biological engineering and there's some good science lessons there. And uh, I've checked with some of my biologist friends, try to make sure the science is as accurate as I can, because I'm not trying to write soft sci fi. I'm trying my very best to make sure this set is set in reality. So, you know, it's a materialistic world. You know, it's an atheistic world. It's a world that uses physics and science and I'm not a scientist, although I'm trying hard to be, so I'll definitely mess things up. But uh, anytime she like does any kind of biological engineering or uh, physics things happen, I'm trying my very best to make sure it's accurate and not like the movie Prometheus or something awful like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good call. Uh, yeah, that that is just always awesome when people actually put in the effort to have like people in, in a specific field to come in and give some pointers or say, hey, you got this shit right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's a thing that um, another thing I want to try to dispel in media is this um, what they say on the the uh, what's the other podcast that I listen to. Uh, well, anyways, there's another podcast. They always say doctor scientists. And it's kind of like their way of talking about this phenomenon where um, a scientist or a doctor will just know everything about all kinds of fields which are not related. Right. Like a physicist okay. would be like, oh, they can't take that medicine. It'll do this with their other disease they have, or they'd be like, Oh, I know how to fix their lung problem because I know about comets. You know, it's like these things aren't related. <laughs> like people who even like even a really great biologist, like, like if let's uh, like Stephen Gould wouldn't understand what these new gravity ways we may have just found are, he wouldn't be able to understand. I mean, any more than any other intelligent person who wants to can try to right? but like to actually understand the math and everything that takes years of study. Science is, all about specialization and you don't see that in media. You just see people who are just, you know, kind of cliche know-it-alls. Definitely. The, the yeah. universal screwdriver is what I've always called them. Yeah, that also works. It's kind of this panacea of knowledge, but yeah, scout, she's a chemist and a biologist. So th those are her specialties. Okay. Yeah. She, I mean, her main role on Titan was to try to, you know, genetically modify plants to try to work in their atmosphere, which is a highly, um, uh, nitrogen dense atmosphere. So a lot of it's about, you know, how you make uh, the chlorophyll economy kind of work in a place where there's a different light spectrum and, you know, different amount of nutrients than you normally would have. So nice. Well, uh, it's time for a quick break and uh, then we'll be back with more. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N.com forward slash atheist nomads. Let's t take it back, way back, way back. Um, when you were a kid, you're, um, we were talking before, before the show a little bit. Um, you weren't uh, raised very religious at the start, huh? Yeah, so my, my mother grew up religious. She was actually a Jehovah's Witness. Um, but she kind of left the faith for, you know, reasons. And um, by the time I was like six or seven, you know, I, I didn't grow up in a religious home. It, it wasn't necessarily non-religious, just was never really brought up. Um, mm -hmm. and so 
I also read a lot as as a child, and like the Ethereum legends were really important to me. I you know would always read different versions of those, skip from the library, and there was always this kind of like idea of like Christendom was really important, and like it was a this noble and just cause. So in my mindset, that was the moral thing to do, and so I I convinced my mom that we should start going to church, oh, wow. and so then you know hmm. growing up until I was like. I don't know, probably 18 or so, I, you know, I was really big into the church. Uh, I would go to church Thursday and Sunday, you know, Thursday was like youth group and then, um, Sunday and then sometimes Sunday night, um, we would have, you know, you, uh, you go and in, in the morning and then like you sing a lot, you stand up and everyone puts their arms up and then someone makes up weird sounds with their voice because they got the God speech or whatever they think they got going on. And then the pastor says something about life and how some old Jewish guy's story can really help you in your life. And then, you know, they ask for money and then we'd go home. We'd go to round table pizza. Everyone would talk about Jesus. And then we'd go back and then I'd play in like the worship band. And those songs are terrible, but I remember all of them. And, you know, I did that for <laughs> quite a long time. And um, I would even consider myself once I got older, I became really interested in philosophy and logic and everything. I, I read a lot of different apologetic books and I, I you know I was a big fan of like C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, mm -hmm. for example. And what's what's interesting is um I, I loved C.S. Lewis when I was younger and I thought, you know, he was really brilliant. But the one thing I regret actually about being atheist is I can't really look at C.S. Lewis anymore. Like I'm kind of ashamed of him. <laughs> and it, it's and I don't mean that to be mean. It actually is kind of a somber feeling because because, you know, I love Narnia and I, I loved his books, but they're foolish. Like his yeah. arguments in mere Christianity are just like fallacious. And it's hard. It's kind of it's kind of like losing a father figure almost. So I can relate. Yeah. I mean, like in mere Christianity, he's like, Jesus has to be, you know, either a liar or insane or he has to be the super ultra messiah. And you're like. How did you possibly determine that those are the only three outcomes? Yeah, because like, what what criteria? There's an easy fourth one, legend. Yeah, he, he's he's mythos, right? He's either mythos or he's confused, right? I mean, there's all kinds of different scenarios, and there's also scenarios where they're mixed. Maybe he did w this miracle, but he wasn't God. So there's another explanation. There's, I mean, there's all these different avenues that ha are more reasonable than just this kind of like pick one of these three. Maybe and you don't Jesus, want to pick the other one, so I got gotcha. you. Maybe right? Jesus never existed, and he was just a, an amalgam of a whole bunch of people. Yeah, I mean, I I personally agree with Richard Carrier's hypothesis. I think that is is the most predictive of the data that um, Jesus was. Um, you know, he's a mythos. He was originally a, a celestial kind of figure that was later um, him memorized and turned into a kind of a human figure later on in, in mythology. Um, mm -hmm. Not not the conspiracy version of mythicism, which is that like the Romans invented him and it's all a plot. That's, that's not apparently true to me. No, that's doesn't. Yeah, that doesn't quite fit, uh, especially since, you know, some of those gospels are actually written by, or not the gospels, but the, some of the epistles at least are written by who they say they're written by most likely. And, so Paul, I mean, Paul probably existed. We have, yeah. And uh, the thing is, like Carrier's argument is that um, Paul never mentions that Jesus is a man, and he's one of our best sources for this whole mythos. I mean, he refers to him as a spirit. He says all the times he talks to him through Revelation. So it's more like this Joseph Smith kind of angel came to me, <laughs> kind of with you know mythology rather than the their super charismatic charismatic jew who is what most people think of as the origin of religion i mm -hmm. think it's more likely it was the kind of celestial inspiration and then he became a character later on well in, in the pauline version of jesus there was nothing prior to the start of like those last couple days like the last supper was the beginning of jesus and yeah, it's, it's that's really weird uh, but it actually fits pretty well with some of the the later gnostic uh, ideas where Jesus was a celestial spirit being who took human form just solely to die. Which is kind of lame. Very briefly. And because this was a spirit body, um, wasn't actually able to die. So 
the Romans crucified him and nothing happened. Yeah. Um, I mean, like some weird the, stuff, regardless of just the gospels. I mean, like there is actually this bias, even in secular, um, his, you know, historians to look at the gospels as some kind of like extra important text. But I mean, if we look at extra biblical texts, we don't see him, you know, that that's quite peculiar. I mean, regardless of the miracles, if, if this person was around, there's kind of this, like, there's too big of a hole, I think, for it to be likely that he existed. Of course, that doesn't prove it. The absence of evidence doesn't doesn't demonstrate enough, but it can. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, like, it, for example, some people say the absence of evidence isn't evidence of assets, but that's not actually true. Because if you, I, like, if a meteor hit on a certain epoch, we would know, we would see in the tree rings. If we don't see that, that's evidence it didn't happen. Um, because it's negative evidence, because there's there's necessary predictive evidence of just lacking. And we have a decent amount of that with Jesus, which, again, doesn't, you know, solve the case, but it's it's a, it's weighed on one side of the scale. Yeah. And, you know, there there's evidence that people believe there was a Jesus 40 years after there was supposedly a Jesus. Sure. Sure. But yeah, even 20 that's not years. Sufficient, right? that's, like, yeah, that's not good enough. It's not contemporary. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on that field. Uh, you have to talk to Richard Carrier about that in yeah. more detail. But that, that's my take on it. Well, everybody knew him. Then everybody forgot. Then everybody remembered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let's tell you how it went. Yeah. And we, we even have American corollaries. Paul Bunyan and oh, I have a friend Blue who Ox. believes Paul Bunyan is real. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, I couldn't believe it. He, like, we used to hang out wow. in, like, high school and, like, play Final Fantasy XI together. And then, like, um, I just befriended him on Facebook, like, two years ago. And we were talking. I was talking about how something's not real. And he's like, Paul Bunyan's real, Miles. What are you talking about? I'm like, you're kidding me, right? He's like, no, dude, you told me that there's just, like, this legend that there's this awesome guy and people just made it up. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I fucking think. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's exactly he, he, what happened. And he's like, well, I'm not saying he's 40 foot, but he was probably like 17 feet tall or something reasonable. I was like, well, that's definitely reasonable. You know, Obviously. like there's all these 17 foot people. I mean, like Shaq's like seven, four or something. And he's just like a homongoloid, right? Like, I mean, there's no 17 foot tall guys running around. It's crazy. Yeah. People, he, people he believe must be, weird shit, right? He must be related to King Og. I <laughs> hope so. Yeah. yeah. Og must have gone with uh, the, uh, Mormon Israelites to uh, the New yes, World. In, definitely in the submarines. Uh-huh. Right? The Mormon submarines. Yep. Uh, King Og, you know, he was, I'm pretty sure you could see him in Noah. He's hanging off the side of the ark. <laughs> <laughs> Someone from Greenpeace just followed me on Twitter. Why the hell would they do that? <laughs> wow. I mean, like my main character in my comics, how about making GMOs? They're probably going to stalk me and send me trolley posts. That's awesome. Glad I have that. Oh one. man, a while ago we got a follow from the president of some Christian college. Sweet. Oh yeah. That was a little bit like, wait, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, I think I don't know, maybe they just see me say something about Gino's and misinterpret it. Because like I made this comment the other day that um the intellectual position of um you know anti-GMO folks is very similar to the climate change deniers, and like some GMO sites retweeted that. And I don't uh. know. If they knew what was going on, or if it was like a bot did it or what, but it was quite comical. <laughs> wow. Although, to be fair, there are a lot of atheists who post the most stupid religious memes. Oh, yeah. Everybody's stupid. All groups are stupid. You know, which, which, um, you see this a lot. Like, there's some groups that I belong to or I identify with that aren't very popular. And, you know, I see like, they're dumb arguments all the time. And people are like, oh, how could you be part of this group? Because these the arguments are stupid. I'm like, yeah, they are stupid. All groups have people make stupid arguments because most people are, you know, they're not great. So, like, I mean, especially any issue that could be, like, easily relatable, right? Like, so, like, if we're going to talk about something really complex, like, what is dark matter, right? You're not going to get as many kind of, like, pop opinions on it. But if you're going to talk about something like, oh, what kind of food is good to eat or... You know, why do men or women act this way or act that way? You're going to get all this kind of pop opinion. And so the discourse is going to be terrible. And that's just kind of how that goes. Mm -hmm. Now, specifically what I was referring to was atheists who post stupid religious memes that they saw like on Facebook into atheist groups. Yeah. I mean, to commiserate. Yeah. So for a while when that was happening. Yeah. I, I wasn't super like bothered by it because I thought like it was kind of our venting process, you know, because for a long time we weren't able to talk to each other. 
And that's all that new atheism is. That that term doesn't really mean anything. It's mm-hmm. we're not a new intellectual position. It's just we can talk to each other now because we have the internet. And so everyone noticed us. Um, and so I thought that for a while, the kind of like bashing and just pure mockery, I'm not against mockery, but just kind of like this pure mockery, like I thought was fine for a while. But a lot of the kind of just Christian bashing memes, I think, are kind of pointless. The ones where it's just like, fuck Jesus, etc. You know, it's just like that doesn't really get you anywhere. I, th- or, I think it's pointless to do it out in the open, but I, th- I think there is a, a good sense of community and really uh, like commiseration if you're doing it in a private group where religious people won't see it. Oh, definitely. Because like, especially when people are first coming out, I think it's kind of like they're just like frustrated, you yeah. know, because it's been hard. And so like they're just like, fuck it, man. Jesus is a cunt. And you're like, <laughs> what? It, that's fine. Makes you feel better. I don't think it's like, you know, helps our cause necessarily but like if people want to vent that way if that's how they that's totally fine i'm not dissing them um but what i don't like is sometimes people like even sam harris who i I like you know he made the point that like oh the bible says that you know pi is this but it's not correct which it doesn't actually say that that's not a fair reading of the bible the bible just said that this was the shape of a well and it you know obviously wasn't that accurate but that kind of stuff is just like oh look how the bible is done here and we're just gonna like just throw it on that and not really research it. And that kind of stuff bugs me because it's like, we should be skeptics first. You know, our atheism is the result of our skepticism. It's, it's not like this great position where like, Oh, look, we realize that there isn't a God. Oh, obviously there's no God. That's, that's an easy question. You know, there's the, I'm I sorry. I'd, I'd challenge you a little bit on that. Sure. Um, our, our atheism should be a result of our skepticism, but in a lot of cases it's still an emotional reaction. Uh, and hopefully people turn it around later and, oh, that, that, that's and develop true. skepticism. Um, I didn't mean to say that that's, that isn't the only way it happens. I'm saying that they, people can be atheists for good or bad reasons. Totes. You know, there, there are people that don't believe in God for reasons that I don't think are, are valid. Um, but I'm saying that what, what we want to have happen is people respect the scientific method, res, respect skepticism, and then the ideology comes. Atheism yeah. is kind of this result of using our good methods to, to answer this hypothesis, which... I don't even know if the God hypothesis should be called that because they won't define God. They never, they won't do it. I mean, like get in any argument, like someone's like, it's like, okay, let's have the argument uh, about God. I'm like, okay, define and demonstrate God. They never get past the first word. They won't ever define it, <laughs> which I mean, that's just intellectually dishonest, right? I mean, like there's nothing, if you want me to demonstrate, I won't even define what I'm talking about. Or there's just use equivocation, be like, well, God is love. And you're like, well, what the hell does that mean? Yeah. When, I mean, when you get to that point, that, you're like, fuck it. You, like, all right, love is, a, I don't need is a brain state, right? Like, <laughs> what the hell is love? It's it's just, it's a way that our, our brain evolved and it feels wonderful. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, giving a little grandeur to that feeling. You know, like, you can have awe in things that we know what they're made of. It doesn't take it away. I, I um, love it when I when you ask them, like, okay, give me your best argument. Then you take it apart. Mm-hmm. And they're like, what about this? I'm like, fuck you. You had your chance. Yeah, it's it's um, it's a bit dishonest, right? It's like if you lose, you should have some honor and like tip your cap and be like, well, you got me. <laughs> like, I don't know. The other day, someone on Facebook was just like, Obama's the worst because he's had a million executive orders and it just ruins. It's all ruined. America's over with. And it's like, Obviously. Here's, the, here's the data. Here's the number of executive orders for president. You can determine if that's good or bad. But there it is. And they're like. Fuck you. Like, okay, <laughs> look, look, man, you were wrong. You know, if you have another argument or have another point you want to make, you know, I'll listen to you. I'm not trying to dismiss you, but I'm mean, like, you just are factually wrong. And it's okay to be wrong. I mean, that's how we learn how to be right. Like, you need to be totally fine with being disproven or even like having your ideas become less likely of being true because that's how we learn what's true. I mean, we didn't like figure out how to get to the moon by like being stubborn and being like nope we're gonna do this this is the way to do that no we tested it we were wrong we were wrong again we tried we died but eventually we got there and that that's how we made all of our progress and i think that you know you really holds us back when people put pride above truth oh yeah uh but yeah what you end up running into a lot of the time is just conflicting epistemologies and if you can't even agree on what evidence is and what a good argument is, uh, there's no point even having the discussion. Yeah, like I, I've said to some people I've argued with, and I just got frustrated. It's like, you don't even know how to know. 
So, like, I mean, how can how can we have an argument about what you think is reasonable? No, you don't even know how to do it. Like, all all of your precepts you just kind of decided on. Like, that's not really a, someone you can argue with. But I mean, like, even so, I mean, a lot of it's our language. Like, I I'm a proponent, and some people think it's kind of annoying. But being careful with the words we use, you know, using proof to mean mathematical certainty, actual deduction, you know, not induction. And and using you know evidence to mean things that be can you know be used to demonstrate something. I, I think it's important we use the words carefully because when we don't, it can make really sloppy arguments. And you know some people think that's super pedantic and annoying, but I, I watch a lot of conversations where people are just talking past each other because they're not using the words the same way. So I think it does matter that we're careful with the way we use words that point to, to you know different epistemological directions. I'm a minor uh, kind of pedantic about. Uh like a, a, a theory and hypothesis. Those are my two uh, bugbears. I agree with you. Like I, I even hate it when people use theory colloquially, because I think theory is one of the highest achievements we can make as a species. You know, when we, it's like so much work and effort goes into the theories that we have. So when people are like, George, our Binks is a Sith Lord theory. I'm like, fuck off. Like <laughs> theories take decades and so much work. And you're just like, look at all this bullshit I put together. George, our Binks is a Sith theory it's like no you have to earn that man and then the concept of laws being actually proven facts yeah yeah no those are just observations they're so far 100 percent predictive right like that's the that's the what laws are they're 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 truths known truths that are 100 percent predictive like, well, they don't they don't explain how it works just that it always happens yeah it's like i mean a lot of our quantum tests, they're 100% predictive. Like we, we move this particle, this happens every single time. So it's a law because we know exactly the way it goes down. It doesn't mean we know all the details. Uh, Gravity is a really good example. It, we know that two objects will always be attracted to each other. That does absolutely nothing to explain how that happens. That's what ICP should have sang about, not magnets. Because we got <laughs> electromagnetism down, but fucking gravity, <laughs> how does it work? <laughs> Yeah, you know, we're starting to get there with uh, the standard model. Yeah, well, we, like they might have found gravity waves. We don't know yet, but that's the kind of buzz around the internet. But like I, Ben Carson, that talking idiot, he uh, said a while ago, like, how does gravity work? And everybody mocked him. But I was like, actually, it's a good question. He probably didn't mean it in a good way because he's a fool. But, you know, we don't actually know. So some kid figure yeah. it out. Get real smart. Oh, and Jar Jar Binks is a Sith Lord. See, that, that I, I think stuff like that is like a good teachable moment for skepticism. And I, we don't do it enough. I don't think we talk about pop culture stuff enough in, in the skeptical movement. I think it would do us a lot of good. Like, that was a great example of how people actually believe that because of a bunch of non, you know, a bunch of irrelevant evidence that didn't mean anything. But like bias confirmation sticks in, a narrative gets there. All this irrelevant data gets compiled in and, you know, pretends to be relevant data because of anomaly hunting. And they're like, oh, people actually believe that, man. Like, I thought, think that we could have used that to, like, teach what it means to be skeptical. Because it's a lot easier than trying to tell someone the homeopathic medicine that your mom's taking for cancer is not going to help her because they're emotionally, you know, kind of walled off to not listen to us. But they might listen that, hey, this idiot Gungan isn't actually, like, level 12 and going to kill us all. <laughs> Uh, all right, and on that note, we're going to take another break. <laughs> we love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice iTunes, please, please, please. Oh, yeah. Fucking rate us if yeah. you like the show. And if you don't, fuck you. But why are you listening? <laughs> Anyways. So, yeah. yeah I, don't know, I don't know who you are, but fuck you, too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't take no shit. <laughs> I don't know the general mood on this show, but I just want to support you guys. So Appreciate it. Yeah. Much appreciated. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, you know, like... Uh, Another big thing that I'm trying to work on with, you know, my comic is uh, a lot of I, I see kind of like atheist Christian or just atheist theists in general kind of discourse is always like um, 
the atheists have such an edge in the conversation because they're like, okay, we have our scientific worldview. And it's normally, you know, uses methodological materialism and Christians are mostly dualists. And, you know, dualism has pretty much been defeated and, and the method, uh, the materialistic kind of paradigm has created methodological science and has been, you know, the best thing we've ever made. And it's been so successful. Atheists are on the winning side of the argument so much just because of the kind of like the wealth of things that it's created. But in after the gold rush, Scout doesn't have all that. You know, she, like there, there will be a scene eventually in the comic where she's going to have to explain, no, we didn't come from this God story. We, we came here because of evolution, but she doesn't have any evidence. Like mm. it's not reasonable for anyone to actually believe her. Mm. And, and, you know, I just thought that that would be an interesting way to flip the paradigm because, like I said, we, we're always arguing from the position of strength. People argue with us on the Internet, which was created by science, on their computer, created by science, how science isn't useful and their God is real. So, like, we're just mm -hmm. on home court all the time. So I thought it'd be interesting they kind of switch that up. And not only is all this stuff created by science, but by atheists. Well, mostly, you know, like, <laughs> like I mean, like, Newton's one of the best scientists ever. He was a Christian, but I mean, like, he wasted his oh, damn time. But with the internet in particular, yeah, uh, yeah, or I don't know. Facebook, about Microsoft, it. Linux, um, Google, all of that, uh, Apple, all of that was uh, the leaders have all been atheists. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Steve Jobs is a skeptic, but he not a skeptic. Know, he, 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 was a skeptic he, but he was definitely he tried to cure his cancer with fruits. Good, good job. Don't mean that just a guy who died of cancer, but I don't particularly like him anyway. So, did it? But good. Bill Gates yeah. is a fairly nice atheist. No, he's mm -hmm. a good guy, I imagine. You know, he's a he's a billion dollars. I don't know how chill that is, but otherwise, he's oh, pretty he's, cool. He's finding good ways to give it away. And that is true. Oh, yeah. he, he he does his very best. I, I don't know the details of his life. So some things he does, I think, are very good. I kind of am against anyone having a billion dollars, but I guess he does a lot of good with it. So I mean, you have a good argument to make about, you know, Windows being shit. But I, I'm on Windows 7 right now, and it's pretty good. I'm um, still running this guy. I mean, I like 10, but 7 has been, you know, a good trustworthy friend for these years. Oh, my home server is running 7. My laptop's on 10. And yeah, yeah I'm having good. I'm having a good time here. But, I work in IT, so I'm on Windows all the time. So. I reluctantly use Windows at work, also in IT, and uh, <laughs> Linux at home. And yeah. Linus Torvalds is a atheist and a very angry asshole. That's, that's all right, man. Anger, yeah. anger is a legitimate <laughs> emotion, let me tell you. Sometimes you just need to be angry. It, yeah. it, it's when that's like the entirety of what you got is the problem, but the, the, there's nothing wrong with a little anger. The Linux Foundation actually had to like formally issue rules for the kernel development discussions <laughs> that were pretty much all written for him to be nice. Awesome. Hey man, you're being a dick. I know you want to <laughs> compile this code in a different way, and I'm sure that's really important. But you don't need to like slap me or like ridicule me to the bone. Well, especially like, considering the fact he has the final say on everything. Yeah, he doesn't need to make you feel like a horrible waste of a human being when he can just say no. Try again. Also, if he doesn't like some, a certain, you know, build a Linux, it's like it's open source. Just make another one. Right. I mean, like. Yeah. Yeah. But forking uh, the Linux kernel would be uh, it'd be interesting to see somebody do that. I, I guess that's fair. I yeah. used to use um, Ubuntu all the time when I was in high school because I was like the editor in chief of a newspaper and they gave me like a good computer to do it all on. And so all <laughs> the other asshole kids would get on my computer to check their stupid MySpace. And so, you know, I put Ubuntu <laughs> on it. Now they're lost. It's like, okay, so what, kids? Can't figure it out. My computer again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's just too much effort for games and stuff. Like, I know I was trying to play Final Fantasy 14 on it, and it just kind of sucked. So I'd just rather not deal with that every day. Hmm. I'm yeah, not Linux, a gamer. Linux, game is, Linux gaming is just about the level of Mac gaming. Yeah, and there's it's... a famous Penny Arcade, you know, where the guy's like, this is a console gamer. You know, just like a kid, just laying on his couch. This is a PC gamer. Guy's like hunched over his computer. He's like, "This is a Mac gamer." And he's like, "Well, there's no one in there." He's like, "That's right, because there are no Mac gamers." <laughs> he's all sad and crying in the dark, except for his Blizzard kids. But you know, Blizzard. Yeah. In in Steam has a lot of games ported to to Mac and Linux. I have like a twenty year rivalry with Blizzard. I hate those guys, <laughs> which doesn't make me a lot of friends on the internet. But all I've ever done is take the games I really like. 
and then like make them super easy and lame and then they get really popular in the games i like die that's like all they've ever done it's just, like is yeah and it's not really on topic but fuck blizzard <laughs> well i actually started uh, if you were talking about mmos i started way before that with everquest yeah that's what i'm saying man i beta tested everquest Fucking i hey. played that game i, I was on up- the i was on the east side server Fucking yeah hey. I, I forget what server was my buddy mitch knows i gotta check i was an elf paladin though and uh oh, oh um, he's a halfling druid yeah that's a good way to be i i had to set that up and and my mom's like in the washing room like with the washing machine and stuff because the only place that uh we had an extra phone line you know because it was dial up and so i had to like <laughs> set the computer and everything all up on my washer and dryer just so i could play and then i had to move it back every night good times. <laughs> the funniest thing is man i didn't know you could get quests until i was like level 20. What? So I'm sitting out here just like killing boars and rats and stuff. I was I was stupid, man. I was like seven years old. And oh. so I I got there and my friend's like, why don't you have any spells or anything? And I was like, I don't know, man. I haven't got any, but I'm going to keep working my ass off to get, you know, whatever spell I get. And then like, he's like, dude, you can go talk to that guy and give you money and experience. And then your life will be so much better. And that was an eye opening experience for me. Quests. <laughs> oh, nice. But yeah, then, you know, I was a really big fan of like um, Dune, the, the RTS game, also Dune in general, but um, or Red Alert, you know, or CNC, Ult- Red Alert. Yeah. Yeah. And Ultima. Mm-hmm. And then they like make, you know, Warcraft and Diablo and all those games mm-hmm. are just those games, but super simple. And it's like, it's not that I hate that they make super simple games, but it's that those games take over. Like no one will play Red Alert. They don't make Red Alert anymore. Everyone just plays Starcraft. And oh, you know, Starcraft. Yeah. It was That's all about total on un- total annihilation. Was the oh, game. total annihilation is so beautiful. You actually know it. Awesome. That game's so cool, man. Like your units die, and you get to scrap them. So like, there's an extra bit of resource control in that game. It's beautiful. Yeah, I still play that shit. Yeah, I try to play it all the time, but my my good buddy Drew is actually my editor in my book. He's terrible at him, so like, <laughs> he's the only one to play with me. Then I just crush him, and then he gets mad. And so like, only twice a year can I get in the get enough self esteem to try to play me. <laughs> Sorry, Drew, if you're listening, you're a good guy. I I had to drop (laughs) MMOs, well, basically EverQuest, because I had three accounts I was playing at once. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah, I just fucking like a crack habit. I had to drop it. That's what you got to do, dude. You got to have lots of meals. You know, you got to have some guy shouting in town to try to buy stuff and be out doing your quests. Like, (laughs) you know how it goes. I could power level anybody from one to 55 in like two evenings. Those are the good old days. Plus, the thing about old video games, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Like, these new nowadays everyone goes on youtube and gets a guide they get like perfect information how to like have the best character we didn't know what we were doing man we just no. run around in the water and like oh shit there's a fucking piranha fuck that piranha and you like run it like there's the troll king you're like what's up troll king he's like oh i'm gonna invade you and take all your tunar and you're dead <laughs> and you're like fuck does that happen to everybody like, <laughs> you know it's, it's a wonderful time to be alive kids oh, yeah <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with science, skepticism, or atheism, but it is important to know how MOs work. If you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per-episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please, think of the kittens. As an Atheist Nomads first, I have to issue a spoiler warning for the following segment. If you have not yet seen the Star Wars movie, and you don't want spoilers, skip ahead to 57 minutes, 50 seconds. Have you seen Star Wars? The new one? Yes. Okay, I just want to say that... uh, Do you let people on your podcast who haven't seen Star Wars? Well, you know... It's possible. After after a month, they they have to. Yeah, I'm saying you're not a fan. I'm not even trying to... That's not even a note you're Scotsman. You're not fanatic about Star Wars. If you knew it was coming out for two years, you waited like 20 years to get a proper Star Wars movie, and then like a month went by and you didn't see it. Yeah, you're just not you, fanatic. You've had your chance. Yeah, you, I mean, you might kind of like it, but I mean, you know, if you care about spoilers or not, then you, your time is gone. Well, even if you only kind of like it, you've seen it within a month. Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Come on. I only kind of like it. Well, that's fine. You but you and I saw it, right? it. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I've seen it three times. Oh, no. I've only seen it twice. Okay. I'm like yeah. a really big Star Wars fanboy. I've read like I have a small every penis now. Timothy Zane book and stuff. So 
man. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to get uh, tickets to uh, IPIC over in Renton because I want the the loungy seats and fucking Sony. I want somebody to cook for me. Yeah, they, those big <laughs> seats are awesome. Oh man, they're so nice. Dustin, we have. <laughs> um, March is coming up. Fucking a, dude. Seriously, I just hate that they don't let you bring your lightsaber in now. It's like what? It's like, dude. The reason why Star Wars stayed alive is because all of us nerds like bought lightsabers and Star Wars toys for all these years. And now you tell me you can't bring my lightsaber in to the Star Wars movie? <laughs> oh, bums me out, man. And my point about Star Wars is uh, Jar Jar Binks is still a Sith Lord. Oh yeah, uh, that's that definitely not true. But but um, I have his character uh, sheet right here. I have to be pointed at. <laughs> right? uh, I just want to say that uh, Finn, Ray, and Poe they're in a triad. Totally. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, Ray. Ray needs to get to high level pretty quick, right? Because I mean, like, she she probably trained with Luke at the first Jedi Temple that Luke's found, and I imagine that you know she had like her force severed or something like that when she was on Jakku. Because I mean, she knew how to use like um, Jedi mind trick and stuff pretty well. I mean, stormtroopers have a low will check, but I mean, she still knew exactly what she was doing, and she used battle mind when she was fighting Ben. Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, like. Um, so I'm pretty sure she has Jedi training, but I mean, we don't know what's going on. There's, there's I th- Kylo. I think, she, I think she's just going to be a true natural. I sus- my suspicion is that she is either, uh, Luke's daughter or Han and Leia's daughter. Uh, definitely not definitely- Han and Leia's. I mean, her and Ben look nothing alike. It's, uh, I've, the, the rumors that I've heard is that she might be Ben Kenobi's granddaughter. Yeah. I don't think that makes any sense. So, I mean, if, but. I mean, if they if they have real brass buttons, the people that are making these movies, she'll be related to nobody. She'll just I, be a one off. Which I mean, would, like, wouldn't make sense then. She should be a Skywalker, though. She has like, to be, and Leia has to have known about her and recognized her because. Well, Kylo said something. Remember, Kylo is like, "What girl?" Like he he is aware that that one of, probably one of the Skywalkers who's female was around somewhere and hidden and also like i don't know if you guys are eu fans but i mean the main story in the eu mm-hmm. is that there is um one of the skywalker kids goes bad he becomes darth Cadius, and then janica um who's one of the solo kids so you know it's technically skywalkers um there's a whole conflict between them and like mara gets killed and then Jadika has to become like a stronger Jedi and go kill him. And that's like the story they're setting up. Like, I mean, they're pretty much mining the EU. They changed the names like like Ben Solo was Ben Skywalker. They just kind of swapped the, swapped the kid around because it was Luke's kid. So it'd be weird to me if it wasn't a Skywalker. Plus the Star Wars, the main stories, they're Skywalker stories. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, like not all the side stuff needs to be, but I mean, like, I understand it's it's not the most creative thing to have her be a Skywalker, but I think it's important for the story. I it just it'd be really weird to me if she's not Luke's kid. I, yeah. I'd be hard pressed to like it. I mean, like I guess I realize that from from a, like a literary thing, you'd be like, oh, let's be creative. But I mean, like, it's just so much emotion to being Luke's kid, especially that final scene where you see Luke and he's like, I'm fucking level twenty one now, <laughs> and like I've seen so much shit, and and like I'm totally gonna ride on your back. And teach you how to be a Jedi, and like you know, I mean that's how he learned, right? So I mean that's the way yeah. it's going to go down. And and if she's like, oh cool, I'm you know whoever, I'm I don't know who you are. I'm yeah. just this random person. It just doesn't have that. I don't know. It doesn't have that Star Wars feel to me. You know, and the fact, just the fact that Leia hugged her, a supposed stranger, well, instead of Chewie. Leia's Leia's a Skywalker too, right? So she uh-huh. she she knew the pain she was feeling. She could feel it all. I mean, she knew when Han died. But yeah. Chewie, somebody Han's best friend, somebody she'd known for decades. Sure, I so I imagine that's who she should have gone to first. Yeah, she was good on his own though, right? That that motherfucker seen some shit. He ran around with Yoda. He had his whole planet got their ass kicked. They lost <laughs> to the Trishodians in like many wars. You know, he's fought lizard people. He. <laughs> He's having a hard day, but like she, Ray, she don't know. She like hangs out on Sand World, you know, with big giant nose monster and like Simon Pegg, who doesn't give her food. That's Simon Pegg in that costume, if you didn't know. And like, 
yeah, she finally like gets out and gets to be cool and like use her force powers, and all this shit goes down. That girl needs a hug. Like, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my take on it. I, they probably I'll, actually filmed it a couple different ways and just went with the shot that looked the best. But that is also possible. Well, I really like the JJ. I'm, I'm, I'm first going to say JJ did a, a pretty fucking awesome job. Uh, yeah. But uh, JJ, he said that there's not going to be any extended cuts. You know, there's not going to be like you know, a director's cut release of the, of the movie. He, he's but there movie. there is going to be some uh, deleted scenes on yeah. the DVDs. Yeah, so, that's cool. I mean, well, well uh, the constable, right? He was totally cut out. So this scene will probably be added. Yeah, I'm, I'm just really glad that they're not going to fucking Lord of the Rings this shit. Yeah, and I actually, had, this is the only thing uh, JJ's ever made that I liked. I think he's a failure, but he did make the biggest movie ever made now, I guess. So mm-hmm. I guess he's a winner. Um, I, well, I hated his Star Trek and I hate, I hate Lost. Yeah. The, um, the big thing there, though, is he is a Star Wars fan. So he did good with that. Yeah, because he, he knew doesn't what to do. he doesn't like Star Trek. Yeah, he doesn't understand it. And you could tell. Yeah, like he it, it's, those are just non recognizable Star Trek. I actually probably would like those movies if they were called like Buck Rogers Space Adventures. But, you know, <laughs> you call it Star Trek, which isn't just another IP. Star Trek's important. You know, it's our wide eyed look at the future. It's the thing that inspires so much technology. It's, you know, it's fucking Star Trek. And you just make them like, you know, make up, make them blow up planets with red matter and like have Kung Fu space fights. And it's like, come on, man. Like they're supposed to talk. They're supposed to have detailed conversations about things. You know, there can be action like there's action in con, but there's also, you know, the Genesis project. It's like what what is the moral ramifications of this how should we use it you know and then like khan's quoting melville the whole time like <laughs> and in his mm-hmm. movies you know like you're just like asshole george bush commander stole the super enterprise because he's gonna make you know the military version for money first of all they're all communists they don't even have money the only time they get money is when they go <laughs> on other planets like risa so they can buy you know risa blue drink or whatever the hell they do in star trek like i don't know man those movies are bad. <laughs> Sorry, JJ. Okay. But yeah. give JJ credit where credit's due. He did uh, produce and direct some episodes of Felicity. My okay, he did. It. <laughs> I no, am but, not familiar with that show. <laughs> but no, he did a great job on Star Wars. Uh, I don't think it's better than Jedi. I think it's the fourth best one. But they're very good. And you know, I'm like really big Star Wars fanboy, so I, I I could have been annoyed by any major missteps. And you know, he played it safe. I think he had to play it safe with the plot. I don't mm-hmm. think they were ever going to let him do anything else. But it wasn't about the plot. It was about the new characters. It was about passing the torch. And Ray, Finn, and Poe are awesome. Um, you know, Ray's one of my favorite Star Wars characters now. Well, this and, is uh, now my this is now my third favorite. You know, yeah. first uh, Jedi is my fourth, uh, and the other three we just don't talk about. Sure. But, uh, I kind of like Revenge of the Sith. I think it's like forty mm-hmm. percent good movie in there. Like the Anakin Palpatine scene in the in the big spear thing that looks like it's from final fantasy 10 the opera house on Coruscant. i like that scene and uh, i don't know i like some of anakin and and obi-wan's dialogue just because he's like you're my best fucking friend you asshole and he's like i'm a total idiot now and he's like that is awful i, I like those because i don't know <laughs> i actually don't have a problem with the with episodes one through three really the <laughs> purpose of them is a prequel they are to tell the story that goes before the real story. But why? that's what just, prequels are. It's just the, One the word biggest medicorians. problem with them. Well, the biggest problem is he did the thing that that the new Dune books do, that like um, Frank's kid does. He makes everything connected needlessly. Like we don't need <laughs> Boba Fett to be the origin of stormtroopers. We don't need Darth Vader to have made C three PO. That makes his universe smaller. Like it's less interesting when we know what's behind every curtain. Like and that's what. And that's why I want Ray to not be related to anybody. No, and like I said, I, I do really hear that. And like, I think that's a reasonable thing to say. I just think it will be so weird if she's not Luke's kid. Like, like I do hear what you're saying. And like, I think in a lot of Star Wars stories, it'd be good. But like, I don't know, she has Anakin's lightsaber. Like, it calls her. She touched it. She had a force vision. Like, it was a holocron or something. And like, she goes to the last Jedi Temple and she just like stares into Luke's face. Like, I'm just too emotionally invested in her being Ray Skywalker. So, just as long as they open the next movie with uh, Ray saying hello, this is my boyfriend Finn and uh, Finn's boyfriend Poe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then I'll be happy. I 
Uh, I'm expecting uh, them to open the next movie with Luke saying, Ray, I am your father. Well, the next movie is Rogue Squadron, right? Yes. Yeah, which is not is weird because Rogue Squadron's about Wedge and the X Wings, and this movie's about a ground assault. So I don't know why they named it that. But oh. I don't know. I hope it's good. Um, I'm really interested if if they're gonna if she is Ray Skywalker. You know, I mean, Luke's been married to Mara Jade in the EU since 1991, and she's one of the most beloved characters. It'd be interesting to me if they gave her a mom that's not Mara, especially since they don't need to show Mara much. It's not like they need to cast a new person or anything or like have her be a major part in the plot. It's just part of the backstory. I, I, I'd be really annoyed if they don't have her be a major character and just like say her name's like, you know, Amy or something and like just change it for no reason. So I, I hope that we get a Mar- Mara Jade cameo because like I said, Mara's been like, the awesome female force user since I was a little kid and it sucked a loser, but we probably will. But if there's anything, anything you can guarantee with JJ Abrams, if he doesn't absolutely have to use it as canon, he won't. Well, uh, JJ is not directing the next one. I yeah, don't think he's no, involved really. at all. Yeah, he's not involved. Oh, I would, which I'm kind of sad about now. <laughs> yeah. Like but, I said, I initially, I wasn't, but, uh, I am now he did a good job. Yeah. You know, he like 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 you said before, he likes Star Wars. He got Star Wars. I don't think he gets everything else he does, but he, he fucking got BB. And oh, BB is awesome. All, I got all BB in camera like, effects, oh. essentially. For the There's most some part. really really good shots in the movie that weren't in the. Pre- um, he also has still used the Star Wars dissolves, the kind of dorky <laughs> movie maker dissolves, which I'm happy because like that's Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, the horrible wipes and yeah, yeah but you know. <laughs> They're no, awesome. Totally. They're, they're, they're horrible and awesome. You said totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> Bet you didn't see this conversation going this way, did you? No, Neither I knew people would talk about Star Wars because that's, you know, you got to talk about Star Wars, right? So every every podcast they have me on eventually, we end up talking about Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might be the common denominator in that. <laughs> yeah, it's not my fault, man. I'm just trying to talk about, you know methodologies and stuff <laughs> and it's like yeah but what methodology would you use if you had a lightsaber well that's a very interesting question <laughs> uh you but, wouldn't because it's magic no they use arc no, and they have crystals they actually changed the way the crystals work which annoys me um like so i mean for like damn thir- ends is broken Shattered. like 30 years you know the crystals were colored because of where they're at and then they forced to tune them now, apparently, they're colored because of the way they force it to them. I hate when they change stuff like that, because, like, I don't know. I'm just such a nerd about it. Never mind. I sound really <laughs> dorky on your podcast. <laughs> I'm sorry. Too late. Yeah, it's okay. You guys got me talking about Star Wars. It's not fair. <laughs> but yeah, also, um, in other news, um, I'm trying to set up a panel at um, uh, Emerald City Comic Con, actually, with... Um, Russell from the Atheist Experience and Jay from Skeptic's Guide and then um, the nice. Biology Babe, who's pretty popular in Facebook. And we're, we're going to call it uh, More Than Scully and talk about, um, you know, skeptics and atheists and popular culture and you know, how can mm. we represent them better? Because um, one thing, especially comics are good at, is kind of like pioneering new stories and pioneering diversity, mm-hmm. partly because comic books um, are, are, are uniquely set up where they're a visual medium, but they have a lower cost of production. So you can mm-hmm. kind of be more risky. Or, you know, movies, you have so many mouths to feed, you end up having so many producers and you can't, you know, be kind of as edgy or creative. And so that's why comics are a good space to kind of pioneer. You want to sit in, you fucking draw it. It's easy. Yeah, that's right. Or, I mean, like, you know, Fantastic Four fought a giant god character that uh, sure. like, way before that was ever anything anyone thought about. But, um, yeah, so we're trying to do a panel at DCC and talk about that because, like, you know, Scully is kind of the only popular skeptic in popular media, and she's not she's pretty much a straw skeptic most of the time. And um, I just think it'd be really important if we had more representation of skeptics in media, because I, I think that we don't, um, as kind of a skeptic atheist community, worry about the messages that are in media a lot. Like, I mean, I think a lot of GMO anti GMO attitude isn't only from this, but is reinforced by things like Jurassic Park. Because it's like, oh, look, they mess with nature. You get eaten by a fucking dinosaur. You know, like, I mean, it's not that they intellectualize it so much, but it frames the conversation. 
you got what you deserve for fucking with nature. Yeah, as I'm talking, which is while they're in an air conditioned room looking at, you know, photons split through millions of different kinds of pixels so they can see a dinosaur created on computers. They talk about how, you know, nature's better while they're enjoying this movie, which doesn't make any sense. But, um, or movies like, um, uh, like a lot of Christmas movies, for example, are all about how people pay for not having faith. Um, which, you know, I'm not trying to bash on kind of the Christmas narrative. It's, it's kindly, it means well, but like Polar Express, like the kid, the poor kid doesn't get any presents and it's because he doesn't have faith. Like that's, that's ridiculous. Mm. I mean, like, I mean, that's almost like just atheist hate speech. It's like, that's what you fucking get. Poor kid. You should have just believed in Santa, even though you didn't have presents and everything would be fine, but you didn't. (laughs) And then like, meanwhile, it's like rich neighbor kid gets all these presents because, you know, she just loves Santa. It's pretty messed up. And, you know, like I said, that movie is meaning to be nice and charming, but those messages are there. And I think it, it's important to have some messages that aren't like that in media, you know, like mm-hmm. people who want to see what's true and who care about truth actually being rewarded for that and said the opposite. Because, you know, skeptics almost always pay for their skepticism. Like I've said this before, but if, if you don't believe a ghost is somewhere in a movie, that ghost will kill you 100% of the time. And I mean, oh, that or black, or if you're black. Yeah, don't be don't be black or doubt ghosts. Not not and good. Wasn't that fucking Tom Hanks in that movie? Wasn't he the the conductor? Yes. Well, robot face Tom Hanks, but yes. Oh yeah, yeah. This is all like CG, but yeah, Tom weird. Hanks is that. Huh. Mm. I wouldn't think Tom Hanks would be in a movie like that. So yeah, well, I said I don't think people see that narrative in too much. I think they they just see Happy Christmas belief is good, right? Because like the belief is good, and by by belief they mean faith. They don't mean belief as in hold the claim to be true. Um, you know, the faith is good is a very popular meme and it's in all kinds of different stuff. And, you know, people don't mean it to be. Cool. It's it's supposed to be a kind of reassuring thing. But I think it's a damaging opinion to have. And I think that we should try to make more media that has the opposite opinion. That's what I'm trying to do with After the Cold Rush. Um, hopefully it gets the message across, you know, like the first the first book's kind of like a touch of the story. We don't get to talk about a lot of the more complicated things I want to do until a couple issues on, but I hope people pick it up and they like it and they get some of that out of it. Hey, when is CC? Um, it's the beginning of April. All right. Yeah. Any traction with them? Unfortunately, they have not given me a table for my book mm. for some reason, which I don't know. I mean, we did pretty well on Kickstarter and everything's going really well with the book, but I don't know. Maybe the guy who picks it is a Catholic or something. Uh, um yeah but it, you know if, if people want us to be there you could message them on twitter and say you'd like to see after the gold or there that'd be a big help but we'll probably have the panel so that you know if if i can't be there just selling my book at least we can be there talking about the cause and i think that's an important thing it's april 7 to 10 yeah april so, times wesley i will i will be seeing you in april then <laughs> okay uh, my uh, wife will be going to emerald city comic con and i will be drinking with wesley and sam Awesome. I'll be there in one way, in one capacity or the other. And I'll also be, be there a, in spirit. Yeah, well, I'll be there physically. <laughs> um, I just don't know if I'll be there professionally or as a fan. Um, but yeah, uh, the book will be out pretty soon. And like I said, uh, if you guys want to get digital copies, you can. That goes to all you listener people out there. And, uh, you know, um, you know, you should think about making something, too, for the cause. Not necessarily you guys, but anybody listening, you know, just try to help create more positive examples of skeptics, science and atheists and media, because, you know, not one person can do it all. And I think it's an important thing to do because media really frames the way people talk about things, especially in an internet age where, you know, pictures or jokes from something get spread around so quickly, they become really powerful ideas. And I think it's important that we have our own versions of things. Mm-hmm. Oh, and miles was very, very gracious to, to make an announcement before the show, actually, that, uh, you, all of you guys can get a wonderful discount on the digital version of After the Gold Rush. It is now three ninety nine. So go out and get. It. Yeah, you can get it on our page. I, I'm not <laughs> advertising it too much to people right now because I'm trying to get it to all the Kickstarter fans. But if any of you guys want to do it, you can get it on the web page for that price right now. All right, yeah. and give us all the links. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you can go to afterthegoldrush dot space, which I think is a pretty cool URL. Um, and there's a little get the book thing there. You can get it there or you can go to at Gold Rush Comic and follow me on Twitter or and I have like my link to my Patreon there where you can help support me and I get money to, you know, go to cons and help keep creating the comic because comics aren't cheap to make. And Twitter, Facebook, other yeah, Twitter is at Gold Rush Comic. Uh, my, I don't use the Facebook as much, but you can go to it if you if you like Facebook. It's just a 
just look for after the gold rush comic and it's on Facebook. And those are kind of my two main ones. I have an Instagram too, but I don't know what it's called. So just, <laughs> just, just go to my Twitter. He's, awesome. he's got a Tumblr too, but it's just full of porn. Oh, I never got it. I, I went to Tumblr like two times and just left. It's a wasteland over there. <laughs> Uh, all right well thank you very much for joining us it's been a blast yeah thanks for having me on the show i'm sorry i rambled about star wars so much but uh oh, that was and for our listeners we'll be back next week with news thank you for listening to another episode of atheist nomads you can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads. And remember kids, Jar Jar is just a gungan. Ha, 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 ha.